We're turning to the book of Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. I'm going to read a few verses of scripture. This message has been echoing in my mind all week long. And I just hope the Lord will allow me to preach it in such a way and allow you to have a a hearing in such a way that the intent of the Lord could be received here in this room. Exodus chapter 2 verse 23 says, Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of their bondage. So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. I want to speak on this subject, impossible. Turn to someone and say, it's impossible. Turn to someone else and say, it's impossible. God bless you. You may be seated. To escape the famine that was in the land of Canaan, Jacob and his 12 sons went down into Egypt. And when the famine was over, they decided to stay. In fact, they stayed for four hundred years. And in Egypt they multiplied and a few dozen became a nation of millions. And they are known as the nation of Israel then and also today. The Egyptians feared the Israelites because they had multiplied to such a great number and they said among themselves if they ever go to war what is going to happen if the Israelites join with the enemy and actually fight against us? And so in order to squash their spirit and to suck all of the courage out of their hearts, they made them their slaves. They placed them into bondage and made their lives bitter, the Bible says, and made them work rigorously until... They were broken and they were, they were discouraged and they were overcome by the, the terrible abuse and the treatment that they were receiving. And so as a result, the Bible tells us, and we read it in our text, that they began to cry out to their God. Their burdened prayer, with, with burdened hearts, they began to pray and seek God. And, and uh, the Bible uses a very graphic term. The Bible says uh, that God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning. I don't know if you've ever prayed a groaning kind of prayer. I don't know if you've ever prayed and it really wasn't so much about the words, but it was the groaning that was inside your heart that you were expressing to the Lord. I imagine that groaning in prayer is a prayer that comes from the deepest parts of your soul. It's, it's not about the words. It's not just about what you're saying, but it is the groaning in the spirit that God was hearing in their hearts. Their hearts were broken and they were fearful and they were despondent and they had run out of options and, and uh, they began to groan and pray to the Lord. But I want you to know that when God heard their groanings, that it was impossible for God to do nothing. When God heard their crying and he felt the spirit of their brokenness, it was impossible for God to just stay idle and to do nothing and 
to ignore their praying. His integrity was on the line. His immutability was on the line. His honesty and his character was on the line. You see, these people that were praying were Abraham's children. They were Abraham's seed to whom God had made a covenant four and a, uh, four and a half centuries earlier. In Genesis chapter 17 and in verse 6 and 7, it says, and God is speaking, by the way, to Abraham, and he says, I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee and kings shall come out of thee. And look at verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Hey Amen. These people who were groaning, these people who were praying, these people who were crying out to the Lord. Hey Amen. They weren't just any other pe person or any other group that was in the land of Egypt. There were other slaves, no doubt, to, to the Egyptians. There were other people that the superpower of Egypt made their slaves. But these people that were groaning, these people that were praying, they weren't just any group of people. They they were the seed of Abraham. And God, 450 or 60 years earlier, had looked Abraham in the, in, the, in the face and he said, I will be your God, but I won't just be your God. I will be the God of your descendants. I will be the God of the seed that comes from you. I will be the God of your people and of your children. Hallelujah. And so from the bowels of Egypt, the seed of Abraham was groaning and praying. His seed was being beaten and abused and broken and taken into bondage. And I'm here to tell you that it was impossible for God to do nothing. It was impossible for God to fold his arms and stand on the sidelines and not respond. It was impossible for God to do nothing in that circumstance. But instead we read in, verse, in Exodus 2, uh, verse 23, back to our text. It says, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt, Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out, and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. And God, so God heard their groanings, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob, and God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. I'm here to tell you that God remembered his covenant, and he could not stand on the sidelines. Amen. And before the dust settled, if you read the whole story, ten plagues came to Egypt. And before it was all done, Egypt was decimated. The soldiers and their horses and their chariots were floating in the Red Sea that God had divided to allow the children of Israel to go through. Before the dust settled, they were on their way out of Egypt and on their way back to the promised land. Amen. Before before it was done, literally, food was falling from the open skies on a daily basis while two or three billion people crossed a dusty desert on their way, to, amen, to the promised land. Why? Because God could not stand by and not respond and not act when his people, the seed of Abraham, were crying out to him. I've come with a message for you today. I've come with a message for somebody today. Amen. A message for those upon whom the name of Jesus has been called. I'm here to tell you that it is impossible for God to ignore your burdened cry. I'm here to tell you that it is impossible for God to do nothing when you pray. I'm here to tell you it's impossible for God to sit on the sidelines 
of your life while the enemy and the world and all the darkness that is in our, our, our lives that closes in and beats us and abuses us and strips us of our dignity. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you it's impossible for him to turn away his attention while you seek him passionately and persistently. Why? Because he has entered into a covenant with you. He has entered into a covenant through Jesus Christ, not Abraham, but through Jesus Christ. He has entered into that covenant when you repented of your sins, when you were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and he placed his name on you. He entered into covenant with you. When his spirit came inside your soul, amen, and God began to take residence in your life, he entered into a covenant with you and I'm telling you amen in the name of Jesus that it's impossible for God while you pray and while you cry out to sit on the sidelines and do nothing hallelujah hallelujah amen it's impossible it's impossible 2 Corinthians 6 17 and 18 says therefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and do not touch the unclean, and I will receive you. And in the next verse he says, I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. I'm telling you that if God will do this for Abraham's seed, what will God do for his own seed? What will he do for his own children? What will he do for his own people? Why are you preaching this? Because somebody here, I believe, has given up thinking that God is going to do nothing. Amen. And I'm telling you, I've come with a word from the Lord to tell somebody it is impossible if you pray and don't stop praying, if you keep seeking and you, and you don't give up, if you pray from your brokenness and your burden, burden and, your, and, the, and the heaviness of, of the things that are upon your life, if you keep praying, if you say, Lord, I'm your child. If you say, Lord, I'm your seed. I've been born from your spirit. Amen. You made a covenant with me. I believe God is going to show somebody in this house that he refuses to sit on the sideline and do nothing while you pray. Amen. Born again Christians are not the seed of Abraham. But it, it, it said in that verse we just read that you are his sons and daughters. God will be a father to you. Not just Abraham's seed crying out, but God is hearing his seed crying out. His children, his descendants. Hallelujah. Amen. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, But as many as receive him, to, him, get, to them gave he power to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I'll tell you who the Christians are. They're a people born of God. I'll tell you who the child of God is. They are the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ, the seed of God. Amen. And when we pray, you can just rest assured. You can go to the bank on it. You can dig your heels in and say whatever you tell me devil I don't believe it because my God he cannot sit on the sidelines while his seed amen is praying when we pray and when we cry out you say well I've been praying nothing's happened don't give up God has a reason amen but I'm here to tell you he will remember when Jesus died on the cross and the blood was poured out on your behalf and when he remembers his covenant he will respond and he will act miraculously on your behalf hallelujah hallelujah amen here's the kind of promises he makes and i'm going to read this from the new living translation because i i think the wording is so cool psalm 37 23 says the lord directs the steps 
of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. He delights in every detail of your lives. You might be saying, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm nobody. I'm just small. I'm just, you know, I'm not significant. I'm not the pastor. I'm not, I'm not, a, I don't hold a position. I don't get to sing. I, I'm just an ordinary person. I, I don't, I, I'm just a saint of God. I'm here to tell you that God is delighting in every detail of your life. And it goes on to say, though they stumble, they will never fall. Amen. For the Lord holds them by the hand. Amen. This is the next verse which is amazing. Once David writes, once I was old and now, or once I was young and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the righteous or seen the godly abandoned or their children begging for bread. David says, I've been in this a long time. I started my relationship a long time ago. I started when I was a very young man, amen, out in the sheepfold, playing my harp and singing unto the Lord. Amen. I've been in this a long time. I've got some experience I can tell you about. Amen. I faced a giant on the battlefield. I was chased through the hills of Israel by the king. Amen. My son betrayed me. Amen. And, and all of these things happened in my life. And now I am an old man, but, but I've got news for you. Amen. God has never forsaken and abandoned the righteous. He has never allowed his seed to be begging for bread. <laughs> Hallelujah. I can't imagine in my own life as a dad while my children were young, and at home, that they would go hungry on my watch. Amen. My wife and I, that we would get to the place where we would be incapable to provide for them. And that they would have to go to the neighbors and ask for their meals because they weren't getting them at home. Their mother and their father weren't able to provide for them. And so they had to beg for their food. I can tell you, as some of you could tell me, that we went through rough times. Hey Amen. My wife and I, while we were in Cornwall, were as poor as crows, as they say. <laughs> I don't know how poor a crow is, but their houses aren't that awesome. And let me just tell you that. A pile of sticks up in a tree. Hey Amen. We were poor. I remember I was without work, and I didn't do this for extra money as some of you have done. This was my main job. Amen. Going out in the middle of the night, driving through the countryside, stuffing, amen, the, 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 the newspaper into the mailboxes of those who subscribed, amen, for a, a measly amount of money, driving over two hours, amen, sleeping on my brother's couch to earn a few bucks so we could provide for our family, amen so we could put food on the table and try to pastor a little church there in the city of Cornwall. But I'm here to tell you that my children never went hungry during that time despite the hardship and despite the struggle and despite the poverty, and despite how hard we had to work, amen, and how little money we got as a result of it. We were broke. We had no vacations. There were no cell phones. We didn't go out to the restaurant, but our children never went hungry, amen. We never had to beg for bread. They never had to go to the neighbors to get food, amen. What am I saying? I'm saying if I am that kind of person, and you are that kind of person, amen, when we think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He isn't poor. He isn't struggling. He isn't broke. He isn't, amen, uncaring. Amen. When his children are in need and they cry out, he said, how many of you have children that cry out and say, give me food? Amen. He says, would you give him a stone? How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. If there's anyone in this room, if there's anyone in this world, I should say, that's God's seed, it's us. 
If there's anyone that can be God, called the children of God, we are certainly among them. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 15 says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit in us calls out Abba, Father. Amen. The Holy Spirit that has filled us cries out, Daddy, Father. Amen. The Holy Spirit in us cries out, Papa, Father. Hallelujah. Why? Because we are His children. And your Father is not broke and He is not weak. And He isn't struggling to make it. Like some of us have had to. And our children are not beggars. And so I want to ask, why do you feel that you have to be a beggar in a time of trouble? Amen. He never lets you become a beggar. The truth is, he will be faithful to you. In the book of Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, let your conduct as be, uh, let your conduct be without covetousness be co uh, content with such things as you have for he himself said i will never leave you nor forsake you i will never leave you nor forsake you the bible says in this scripture it says he has said and so I asked myself the question, when did he say that? Where did he say that? I'll tell you where he said it. He said it in Deuteronomy chapter 31 in verse 6. Uh, through Moses, uh, when the children of Israel were about to, hey, meant to enter the promised land, and their leader Moses uh, was about to die, and Joshua was going to be the successor, God says to the nation of Israel, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He said it later in the book of Joshua chapter 1 verse 5 when Moses had finally passed away and Joshua was the leader God reiterated the, the, the promise personally to him in Joshua 1 verse 5 when he said no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses so I will be with you I will not leave you nor forsake you amen that's where the writer of Hebrews was referring when he says he has said but I want you to notice back in the book of Hebrews in that scripture that I quoted he didn't quote it exactly as it was said in the book of, of, of Joshua in the book of De De Deuteronomy he actually strengthened it he says this is what God has said I will never leave you nor forsake you he didn't just say I will not leave you nor forsake you he said I will never leave you nor forsake you amen do you understand when I say never amen I'm a mortal man I live a hundred years or or maybe I hope amen I live a certain length of time and then I pass off the scene but God is infinite God is unchanging amen God amen is all powerful and he when he says never it's a big word when he says I will never leave you nor forsake you that's a big word that's a big promise and I'm telling you that is what his promise is to his seed hallelujah if our musicians could come hallelujah I don't know how bad it is for you I don't, I'm preaching this sermon. I'll tell you when I got it. I got it last Sunday night. At the close of the service, I was standing at the pulpit. And I was looking and there were certain people that I observed. And in my heart, I heard these words. It's impossible for God to not answer their prayer. It's impossible. I thought my soul, that's a pretty strong that's a pretty strong statement, impossible. But I'm here to tell somebody 
that it is impossible for you to pray and not quit praying, to pray passionately, to pr pray persistently, to pray with all your heart. And by the way, this week, uh, Tuesday through uh, 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 Thursday, we're not gathering at the church necessarily, but we're having fasting and prayer, three days of fasting and prayer. Hey, Amen. But I'm here to tell you that when you pray, and you pray passionately, and you pray from your brokenness, uh, and you pray from your burden, I'm telling you, I am telling you, I'm standing today. I put my reputation on the line. I'm standing on the word of God. God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, I am telling you, it is impossible for God not to move. It's impossible. I started this when I was young. Maybe we could all stand. I was a young man of the age of 20 when I walked through the door the first time in the city of Kingston on Alfred Street to that little Pentecostal church. I came broken. I came discouraged. I came messed up. I'm 53 years of age now. I started young and I'm a little older now. And the Lord has never forsaken me. I know I've been in places where I felt afraid and I didn't know what to do. I remember crying many nights saying, God, where are you? In my own unbelief. I've been in the places where I felt like the things that I was feeling I couldn't tell anybody but Jesus. The feeling of discouragement and hopelessness and fear. Nobody would know. But I cried out. I can't tell you the words because the words were not nearly as significant as the feeling that I had as I groaned them. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I remember I was traveling two hours twice a week to my brother's. I was out of work and he took me in. I wasn't a skilled carpenter, and he was a trim carpenter, and for six months I worked for him. I slept on his couch, which was a hand-me-down couch from a, another poor preacher, so you know what kind of couch it was. As I'd roll around on that thing, not able to sleep, the back of the couch would sink in so deep that I would part of my body would actually fall into that. Figured while I was there, I could maybe look for change anyway. But I remember, I think it might have been the darkest day in my life. And I told the Lord, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. You have to help me. You, you got to do something, God. I can't do this. I was so broken. Within two weeks, I received a phone call that changed the direction of my life that even spilled over to my time here in Hamilton. I believe it was because God... Why did he let me get to that point? I guess probably, probably because I had, to, I had to come to that place where I needed him. Maybe I needed to cleanse some things in my life. Maybe there's some things I had to change. But when God rushed into my life, after a, a season where it felt like heaven, 
was shut up. God set something in motion that I'm still feeling the positive effects of it today. And I want to tell somebody that it is impossible if you seek him and don't give up for God not to move, not to open a door, not to allow something to come into your life. Not to ha- not, it's impossible for him to sit on the sidelines with his arms folded and say, well, I hope it all works out for you. No, 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 no. We are his seed. And he is our father. And our groanings come up into his ears and he acknowledges us. And when he moves and when he acts, there'll be no doubt in your mind that your heavenly father was with you and hearing you the whole time. Today as we open this altar, I want someone to come with an understanding. It's impossible. It's impossible for God not to hear me. It's impossible for God to do nothing. It's impossible for God not to act in my life in response to my praying. If you're that person, why don't you be the first? Step out into the aisle and walk all the way to the front and say, I don't really care. I want Jesus Christ to know that I believe it's impossible for him not to respond in my life. As they begin to sing, come, begin to lift your hands and pray. God wants to move in your life. Go ahead, let him move.